Today, some fodder for ongoing discussions about abortion laws and enforcement in the post-Roe world. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. The underlying principle today, or at least the unifying concept in the discussion today, uh, is contained in the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, And I encapsulated this idea within that phrase when I was very young in ministry. Not even in ministry, I was just a, a college student at the time when I realized how powerful a presence is in the way we, reg- we regard things, that to remove something from our immediate presence in some way causes us to disregard it altogether. It becomes just inconsequential. And I know that there's an obvious way that's true in terms of the immediacy of its impact on us and so on, and that has a lot to do with what I think drives this psychologically. But I mean, even just the... even even just a minor acknowledgement of how important or grave something is becomes completely negligible. I mean, we, we erase it practically completely as long as it's on the other side of the horizon, as long as it's not directly and immediately affecting me. Now, I know different people have different levels of risk and different levels of planning and preparation for things. And so it's different for different people, but it is the same adjustment, whether it happens at the same level or not, that presence implies power. And therefore, when the presence is gone, hence out of sight, the influence or the power that that thing has over us is also gone, hence out of mind. So out of sight, out of mind, that's the idea. And, and it actually is very directly related to sight itself, as it turns out, as we'll talk about in a moment, at least in some people's arguments. Uh, so I will bring that up in a moment also. But I want it specifically to be about us following up, uh, you know, after January's done, January is the sort of pro-life month because of the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I know that now that Roe has been overturned, there will be a change in how we regard that. But you know, for around 50 years now, we've been observing this this period of time and doing something uh, about sanctity of life in the language that I would use for it. And so I want to do that in this conversation as well. So that, that's where this is ultimately going, to that conversation and where the culture is on it right now. And my concern that we're not aware of how much this concept of out of sight, out of mind has on our thinking about all of these things on the pro-life side itself, on the pro-choice side, and the way we regard people who are pro-choice, and on the side of enforcement and the way we think about enforcing enforcing things in our culture. And so first of all, just the basic concept, I just want to establish that this, this is consonant with the way things are talked about in Scripture, not because this is a Bible lesson, I'm not doing an exposition, but I, it is just an assumption of human nature throughout history, and so this is a, a, a handy ancient text that we can use to establish that. Uh, first of all, this is a simple example, but in, in 1 Peter it says this, though you have not seen him, referring obviously to God, Christ, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. That phrase I'm sure you're familiar with. What's interesting about that is the adversative that's put on seeing. Though you have not seen him, you love him implying that it makes perfect sense to love someone you see. That's the idea. Of course, we would expect that. 
the amazing thing about faith is that we have this ability to love something we can't see. That's remarkable. So the norm, the assumption of human nature is that our concern about something, our empathy for something, our regard, our the significance that we give to something is related to our ability to see it. Even when Scripture talks about God, and I'll go to the Old Testament this time, obviously there's a plethora of these examples. I'm just handpicking a few. But God sees and hears Israel and responds by caring about them. At the beginning of Exodus, you know, when it's time to deliver them from the people. And he says this twice, uh, importantly, in Exodus 2, at the end of the chapter, just after Moses has fled off into the wilderness, it says, during those many days, you know, he goes off to Midian because he's afraid he's going to get caught and so on. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help, and their cry for rescue from, from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. He actually, and this is, I mean, of course it's anthropomorphic language, and I wouldn't even mind calling it accommodation for us because obviously God knows everything, but there's something God does to bring this to the front of his attention, to the front of his mind, and the language he uses about it is having seen it, he now knows it in a way that causes him to do something about it. He even communicates that to Moses when he says to him, I have seen the affliction of my people in Egypt in the third chapter of Exodus. And, and by the way, in that story, and I'm going to say this very briefly, but I do care about the story a lot, so I'll mention it. Moses is the opposite of God. The whole point of Moses going into Midian is to separate himself from the people that he no longer wants to be identified with because when he tried to rescue one from another, one that, you know, one of his uh, brothers, a Hebrew, from the Egyptian master who was beating him, his own brothers turned on him. Oh, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And he knows that there's a risk there. And that's why he doesn't want to go back when God wants to send him back, too. All of that is saying because Moses removed himself from the presence of of those people, he learned over a 40-year period not to care about them anymore. Didn't identify himself with them at all, evident, by the way, in the fact that he didn't even circumcise his own son. Didn't, didn't put his own son within the covenant until God confronts him about it on the way back to the people that he didn't really want to go see again like that. So presence has incredible power on us, and if we can get rid of that presence, if we can isolate people from us, if we can make it so that we do not see them and do not hear them, eh, then we can go on about our business and do what we want to do, right? That's just kind of how we live our lives. So, But we're not supposed to be that way. We're supposed to be like God in the sense of seeing and hearing and responding, therefore, caring about the things that are around us. Uh, that's why... John puts it this way in his first epistle, whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother's need, and then who would do this? Shut up his heart from him when you see the need? But if you did that, then how does the love of God abide in him? The whole point of this is we're supposed to imitate the nature of God in the fact that when he sees the need, his heart is not shut up, and he does want to help which obviously he does through his son. And so, uh, and I'm, uh, look, I'm not, I'm not reading all of this to give you some kind of formula as if in Scripture there's, you know, you always have to use your eyes to see these things. It's an image, the, the seeing and the hearing is in one sense an image uh, that, you know, finds, it, and, and, and because of this, because of our experience in being in the presence of things means we can see them and that we can hear them it has, this, it has this power to compel us to recognize that seeing something or hearing something means we care about it. We recognize it. And so that image is rooted in our experience. And, it, and by the way, it's so deeply rooted in our experience that we have these uh, immediate, these visceral reactions to things. It's why people turn away uh, immediately or cover their eyes at seeing things that are just too much to bear. We don't want to see that person suffer in that way. And so I can remember back in 1985, 
uh, when Joe Theismann was injured. No, you know, no, the, you, those of you who were small children or dead, or, I mean, didn't exist back then. Uh, obviously, you don't remember this. But I remember when that event happened, when Joe Theismann's leg was broken and his career was ended in that really horrible thing. They showed it on TV. We watched it. And it was just, oh, it was like, what is happening? And, and I think... I, and I may remember this part wrong, but if I remember right, in the wake of that, they started making new rules about, no, it's not rules like regulations, but I mean the broadcasters stopped showing those injuries over and over again because it was just so traumatic. But I remember, I looked away. I could not look at the screen. It caused too much pain to be able to see it. Saw it just the other day when Tony Pollard was injured in the Cowboys game, which injured us all, by the way. Aside from the injury to Tony Pollard, for which I am concerned. I hope he recovers completely. It's fantastic. Okay, anyway, all of that said, it is, it's in our nature. You see what I'm talking about. The fact that you want to turn away when you see an injury like that happen is built into us. Empathy, you know, concern for someone else that makes us identify with it and want to do something about it. It's, it's what we were designed for, to extend in both senses, to extend to others what we would feel ourselves in their place, and then to receive from others what we would feel ourselves in their place, just to share someone else's experience. And there are lots of, you know, there are lots of ways that that would happen. I mean, it, it's, but that we have empathy with others because we are part of the same family. And that means every other human being, we're part of the same family. You say, well, I'm part of God's family. Well, Paul himself, speaking to people who did not believe they were not Christians, says we all have one father, talking about the fact that God created us all. We are all one family in that sense. It makes perfect sense that we would look at any other human being and be designed to feel in ourselves what we are seeing them have to feel. It makes sense that that would happen. And it's also, I, I think, just a part of bearing God's image, that we represent his presence here in the same way that he has dominion over all things and sees those things and cares about them. We are supposed to care about those who carry that same image that we do. And, you know, physically, I mean, scientifically, which I know nothing about. I mean, I looked at I, I looked at this in Britannica, for crying out loud, you know, to make sure that I used the right vocabulary is all. Uh, and but, but I mean, the basic idea of mirror neurons uh, is this concept that it produces not only imitative behavior, but also empathy, that it generates within us a sensation that makes us feel what other people are feeling. You know, these mirror neurons, the, I don't know, where is it, the amygdala or something like that, where this is supposed to be rooted. Not all the mirror neurons, but the, the sense of empathy and the strength of empathy in people. And you know what? Uh, according to Britannica, <laughs> who could disagree with Britannica, right? Uh, it is mostly about sight, interestingly. The experiments demonstrate that there is more empathy associated with sight than with anything else. There is some associated with sound as well, which makes sense, babies crying, stuff like that, but also sight. And hence, back to the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. And uh, that, so that concept, as simple as it, as it sounds, out of sight, out of mind, I just want to take and apply for a minute to prenatal life, to how we think about these little babies that we're supposed to protect when they're in the womb and that we don't do. So I, again, I'm going back with my age and talking in something far before Joe Theismann broke his leg. Uh, there was a film back in the 1970s that came out. I remember seeing it at the church I was a member of in the 1970s. As a teenager, I was in this church. Uh, and they showed the silent scream. Uh, if you you remember the title, you if you know anything about the history of the pro-life movement, you're bound to recognize the name of that. And literally, it was a film that you rolled up on a you know thing and played on a projector in that way. Uh, the silent scream that went from church to church, and I'm sure other locations as well, and showed this doctor showing I you know, it's a sonogram or pictures, images of a baby uh, while an abortion was being performed, and at some point. Uh, the baby's mouth opens. You can see the baby's mouth open, and he and the doctor talked about it being a silent scream, and it was it was impactful. I'm almost crying now thinking about it. Uh, and the purpose of that film, I mean, so that was a long time ago, but you can see the impact it had, and it had that impact on a lot of people. And I think I think justifiably, uh, others look back on it now and they say it was uh, you know that it was playing into people's emotions and stuff. 
well, our emotions are a part of the reality of who we are. And it makes sense to me to say that we shouldn't neglect emotions that are intended to create in us an appropriate and moral response to the suffering of others. And so uh, I don't mind that this thing appealed to our emotions. But anyway, the, the whole purpose of that purpose of that film, and this was part of what made me start using this phrase, uh, was to point out, he may have said this phrase, for all I know, I took it from the doctor in that film. Uh, but it, it is that idea that uh, the reason we're comfortable with abortion, the reason we were comfortable with abortion, uh, is because you couldn't see what was happening. You know, it was invisible. It was just a lump or something like that. And to bring it into sight brought it into mind, made us aware of what was going on. Out of sight, hence, out of mind. That's the same thing that's going on with the Psalm 139 project. If you want some way to contribute uh, to the hearts and minds of people so that their attitudes about abortion are changed. The Psalm 139 Project is a good way to do that, and you can figure out your own way to, uh, to relate to that. You can look it up online. It's easily available. But they provide sonograms uh, to help uh, mothers be able to see their babies. And there are people who actually object to that. I understand why they do. I'm not agreeing, but I understand why they do. Because there are many uh, women who don't want to have to see the baby. They don't want to have to see the fetus. They don't want to see what is about to happen inside of them. And I get that because they're already in a, a difficult, unbearable, almost untenable situation. It is a crisis in life that they're going through. And then we drag them in and say, well, you have to look at this sonogram before you can do it. I get why people object to that. But the reason people object to it is the reason it's so valuable, because it's not like we're creating a false image. It's not like we're painting something that's not there. We're simply saying, look, we, we want you at least to see what the options are here, and you don't understand the options because you don't understand what you can't see. And so let us show you this baby. Uh, and that that appeal is to is to that concept, out of sight, out of mind. So let us put it in your sight so that the presence of this little being, this little baby, can have an impact on the decision that you're making. The difference, by the way, between late-term abortions and infanticide is simply that. We're still not okay with infanticide. I know the extremists who talk about it as if it's all going to happen, on both sides, by the way, as if it's bound to happen and we're going to allow it someday and all that. And maybe we will. I think it's a horrible prospect. I don't think that's realistic right now, but whatever. But, it, but uh, there are legitimate concerns about some of the stuff going on in, in uh, some of the other states. I get that. I'm, I'm not dismissing that. But I'm saying as a culture, people don't think infanticide is okay. And you know why that is? Because you can see the baby. It's right there. And the idea of a late-term abortion, people still justify, not everybody, but a lot of people still justify because the sense of presence is different on the other side. And so I, on the other side of birth is what I mean by that. And so uh, that, you know, that, that out of sight, out of mind concept is always there. And it's also, you know, this, by the way, uh, even though doctors do see what's going on, they can, and they see the results of what's gone on, it is the same idea with doctors for a reason that's important to the rest of the conversation. That is physicians who perform abortions. It's, this is why some doctors and, and some who work with them manage to arrive at a place where they can still do this and it not bother them, where they can still see the little body parts and it not bother them. And it's the process that I've talked about on, on, on different episodes quite a few times it's the process of dehumanization. Uh, it is a desensitization in general, but very specifically, it's dehumanization because our empathy, even when we apply our, so let's, let's go the opposite direction for a second and say, we can apply our empathy to animals. We can apply our empathy to plants uh, and, and weep over the, or, or a car breaking down. Oh, my car has been destroyed. And, you know, Lucy, I think you had a car named Lucy. I'm pointing at Daisy across the room who's producing the show. Uh, and it's, you know, we, we think of them in a sad way. I had a friend whose car was Jezebel. He actually liked Jezebel. I mean, you know, the name of the car is Jezebel, so you know it's not a faithful car. But he still loved the car, and I remember him being sad when he lost that car. 
We do that because we humanize non-human objects. We give human characteristics to the dog that's smiling back at us, right? Probably using mirror neurons to do that, by the way. Some recent research suggests the dog is doing that. But the point is, we're different from them. We're, we're, they're, they're not human beings, even though I like the fact that we treat our pets well, that we ought to do that. I'm good with that. Don't, you don't have to write a letter about it. So my point now, though, is to say we go the opposite direction with other human beings that we have to do things to that would normally make us uncomfortable. And doctors have to do that all the time, even with things that we require of them. You know, cut me open and take this tumor out or do whatever. Those are things you don't want to do to other people. I don't want to cut people open. That seems wrong. And yet we need a doctor to do that. And so that you have to have a sense or, or an ability to, to desensitize so that you can treat this thing like an object. And then we need that, you know, that person who's uh, taking care of us uh, to turn around and treat us like a human being again. And that's the magic, uh, you know, that doctors have to perform. I'm going to fix this machine that's fleshy and, you know, walks on two legs in front of me. And then I'm going to sit down next to the bedside where that thing is sitting and uh, show it that I actually care about him or her, that person. Uh, and so that's a huge challenge. Well, in, you know, obviously in uh, abortion, there is an ability to say this is not a baby anymore. This is not uh, a human being that I'm dealing with. And so we lose the solidarity that we should have in our empathy for that baby. And historically, we've done that with all kinds of people, this dehumanization, this objectification of things that we ought to regard in a way that causes us to have empathy with them. But instead, we treat them purely as objects. Uh, and so, and, and again, we've done it in war. We do it in, you know, in atrocities that have been committed throughout history because people are of a different race or because they look different than we do in other ways or they participate in the economy in other ways or speak a different language or whatever it has been throughout history. We've been able to objectify people in that way. Well, and by the way, I know it's not a perfect campaign, but it's not bad either. One of my favorite things about the He Gets Us campaign, about which I know next to nothing, except for what I see on, you know, pop up on TV as a commercial in these football games where my heart has been broken recently. But anyway, the point is, when I see these ads, one of my favorite things about them is not only the statements of solidarity that are in them. He gets us, you know, we are together in this and God understands us because of what he did through Christ. But particularly the idea of seeing the similarity between populations we often do dehumanize and then the people we more easily identify with, the Mary and Joseph, or even just Jesus when he's in the world, the sumum bonum of humanity, uh, Jesus himself. So that dehumanization is what makes the language uh, you know, of calling a baby tissue or growth or a clump or a tumor even, so important to pro-choice people. Uh, it allows us to think differently about that object than as a life, a human life that's being dealt with. And it's why pro-life people are, are nervous even when they hear terms like zygote or blastocyst or embryo or fetus instead of baby. I don't think there's anything wrong with those terms at all. But you do get why a pro-life person would be nervous. Oh, you're discounting the humanity. And so paying attention to it, you recognize that what we're appealing to is simply empathy. Do you recognize the presence of another human being here? And so we all hear the accounts. We've all surely heard the accounts of women who were abortion-minded, interested in ending this crisis pregnancy for reasons that we may never know, that are deeply embedded in their own life's experience. I get it. And then they hear a heartbeat. You know, some, you know, there's an accident, accidentally, somehow or another, this, you know, the, the stethoscope or the sauna or, or the whatever's going on, that they hear the heartbeat and their whole attitude about the life inside of them changes. Or they feel the baby kick. And suddenly they realize there's a person in there and they think about it differently or they see a hand in a sonogram and everything changes for them. What's out of sight 
either literally or psychologically. And in this case, I'm saying we do it psychologically by saying, yeah, I can see that thing over there, but I'm not going to count it as a human being. Remember all the leaflets, all the flyers, all the material? If you ever go through Yad Vashem, the the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, or if you get to go through the one in in Dallas here or Washington, D.C., then, you know, you see the, the materials that Nazis were putting out about the Jews that dehumanized them, that made them look like chimpanzees or something other than another human being that ought to, re, ought to be regarded with empathy. That's putting this person out of sight psychologically. And if you can put something out of sight, then you can easily put it out of mind. So if we choose to see a person as subhuman, which a lot of people did in World War II, uh, soldiers talked about the Japanese being subhuman in ways because of the war that they were fighting and the, and the things that they were doing in the war. And it's hard to discard that when you've come back from a war like that. I've heard those soldiers talk about it. Uh, so if we choose to see a person as subhuman, then we're no longer seeing human suffering. And our response to it changes. We no longer have a reason to empathize with them. Oh, well, they're not one of us. They're not experiencing the same things I would experience. This is just chaff that we're taking care of and so on. So that's why I think it's so important in any discussion we're having about life that at the front of it is us remembering that what we're talking about are human lives that we're supposed to have, with which we're supposed to have empathy. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, we don't have any greater empathy than we have for little babies when we come across them, when we see them. And then, th so now let's take a step forward because there are about four steps I want to take today, and that one was a long one. But the next step, apply that same idea, out of sight, out of mind, right? The, the power of presence, Apply that same thing to women who are facing an unplanned pregnancy. So let's just talk about women in general first. This sounds like a high-risk venture for a, a man on, a, on an episode of a podcast, doesn't it? Not, not super so, though, because I, not super risky, because uh, I'm a dad and, uh, you know, and a husband, and I have a sister, and I have a mom, and, and I know them. I know them as human beings with whom I empathize. I work with women with whom I empathize. I identify with them as human beings. When I was growing up, I was surrounded by, in fact, I read on a memorial site uh, for classmates from my high school, Lamar High School in Arlington, uh, the death of a woman that I had great respect for when she was a girl in my elementary school classes. And she passed away not too long ago. And it was heartbreaking to me. It was sad because she was the smartest person in our class. And we all knew it. So it was like we all walked in and we had, a, we had lots of people that were, you know, quick and funny and athletic and, you know, all these other things. But when she walked in, everybody knew she was the one person who knew all the answers in class. I regarded her as a human being. In fact, a human being better than I was. And everybody else in class thought exactly the same thing. For you know, it seems obvious to me that we would have empathy with people of the opposite gender. And yet I've realized over time that it's 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 very easy for us on both sides, but probably easier for men because of the advantages we've been given in a patriarchal history, whether you like that term or not. I mean, come on, we've had some advantages. Let's just be honest about it. It is really easy for us to look at people of the opposite gender and discount their human features and regard them instead as objects. I mean, we do it sexually. We do it in terms of the work that they produce. We do it in terms of them producing babies. There are all kinds of ways that men have objectified women over the, over the millennia. I'm not saying women have never done it to men, but I'm saying, though, you know, it's easy for me to talk about it on this side because I know men have done it to women. And one of the things that people have used to try to remedy that, and I mean just psychologically, in a moment, not trying to overturn the patriarchal society or advocate for feminism, but just in a moment, speak to a man in a way that says, hey, let me get your attention. In fact, I'll tell you a story. I don't want to tell this story, but it was... 40 years ago, so give me a break, okay? 40 years ago, I'm going to confess. 
40 years ago, I was out knocking doors with a friend of mine. His name was Fred. Knocking doors means we were going, telling people about the gospel. And so we were doing it in a dorm room at the time. We were going through a dorm building and knocking on doors in the dorm. We could do this because we were college-age students. Nobody thought anything about us. And so we knocked on this one door. We went inside, and there were posters on the wall. You get what I'm saying? There were posters on the wall, right? And so my, you know, so I was distracted. Uh, and my friend Fred was talking to the person, and I wasn't, and I was distracted. And I remember Fred saying to me when we, when we, were, we were still in the room, and he said to me, I mean, right in front of the person we were talking to, he said to me, you know, that's someone's daughter. <laughs> and it was like, oh, oh, yeah, well. There you go. That changed my attitude in that moment. I'm not proud of that. I'm saying, come on, I was 20 years old, and it was 40 years ago, which is two confessions. I'm confessing I'm 60, or basically 60 now. Anyway, the point is that phrase, you know, that's someone's daughter, which I've heard others express. Uh, I've heard other people say it in different settings, you know. Uh, well, now I realize that I have it. Now that I have a daughter, I, I think about women differently than I did before. I've heard men say that. And those, I think those are beautiful expressions. They are reminders of the humanity of a human. And it changes our way of thinking about them in life. And it's easy for men to grow up seeing women as objects in jokes, objects for pursuing, objects to be controlled, in other cases, objects to be avoided or feared. So when we think of women having abortions, it's easy for us to caricature them into one of those objects instead of seeing them as a neighbor or a member of our church or someone who's just as human as we are and facing the same kind of crisis that we would be facing. And so my, my so what, and I've, I had this conversation in a much longer form in other episodes, in, including, by the way, an episode we did about talking about incarcerating women, which I'm about to get into in just a moment, uh, in the cases of abortion. And I think that was the 52nd episode, if I remember the number right. Daisy will create a link to it on the the website so that you can get to it if you want to go listen to that episode. And in fact, if you're considering issues about this, I would strongly encourage that because we went into a lot more detail on that episode or those episodes in the post-Roe world. I think it's about the post-Roe world. So anyway, with that said, that, that's the second step. It's just recognizing that we can depersonify, dehumanize persons of the opposite gender, and we do that to women, and therefore we do it to the people who are getting abortions, and we forget to think of them as someone who is just as human as we are. And we do it with others also, which I'll talk about in just a moment, because what we do, and this is happening in, this is in conversations now, we talk about, and I, I, this is just so absurd, I just, it's not, I wish it were absurd enough that it couldn't enter the conversation, but it's such a bad idea, I'll say it that way, that it shouldn't enter the conversation, I wish it were absurd. We talk about putting women and doctors who provide or have abortions into prison, uh, giving them some kind of incarceration, some kind of punishment for what they have done. And again, go back and listen to those episodes on the post roll world, and you'll know that I have n- I'm not qualifying at all the fact that I find it immoral, that it's wrong, that we shouldn't do it, that we ought to advocate against it, and that we ought to do something to prevent it. I'm in favor of all of that. But none of that is the same as prison, which I do want to follow up on for a minute. Now, there are a bunch of, there are, there are 13 states right now, best I can find in New York Times article that Daisy provided for me. Uh, there are 13 states right now that have an outright ban on abortion. Uh, and this is uh, pretty current. So if you look it up in the New York Times, they keep current information there. I know it's behind a paywall, but Daisy can link to the article there. And in case you want to access it, you can go to it. Or if you want to, you know, subscribe or something like that, feel free. But uh, 13 states have an outright ban. Five more than that, so adding up to 18, have a ban after a certain period of gestation. So after six weeks, you can't get it, or mostly after 12 or 18 weeks or something like that, uh, you can't get one. Six more states have a ban, but it's not active because it's currently blocked by uh, the courts in some way or another. After that, there are 16 states 
that protect abortion, that make sure there is abortion access in practically all cases, at least through viability. So that, and that's where the range of states are right now on where abortion is legal and where it's, not, where it's not legal. And by the way, some of those states where it's protected, it's not only protected, but there's legislation in place having been signed into law by governors to ensure that women who come from other states where it's not protected are protected when they have an abortion in their state, meaning, I assume, that they're not going to allow that information to be shared back to the state where they, you know, where they fled so they could get an abortion. So that's how intense the difference of opinions is across the country between states on how these ideas should be enforced or allowed or whatever or required uh, based on, you know, the post row in the post row world. So there's, in general, in, in, with all that going on, in general, there's been a resistance, thankfully, to the idea of prosecuting or punishing women who have abortions. I'm, I, and I'm very grateful for that. That's a horrible idea. But, there, and again, if you want the reasons for that, all the arguments for it, and I'll mention some below, but not fully, uh, go back and listen to that other episode I was talking about. And, and I do encourage you to do that. I think it's worth hearing. But there are, even though there's a resistance to the idea of punishing women, you know, who get an abortion, there are still individual legislators, just individuals, you know, who are proposing ideas in a few states to push that kind of legislation. It doesn't seem like it'll pass, doesn't seem likely, but once it's on the table, who knows what's going to happen, and I just hate the idea that it's even out there. Look, there are, there are problems with incarceration to begin with, especially when it comes to women. I mean, today, I didn't do any research other than opening my email today. And for instance, I receive a newsletter from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Here's one of the stories in the Chronicle of Higher Education today. And I'll read, and this is just an article. I mean, this is just in the newsletter, I'm not reading you the whole article. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, so this is about a, a woman named Alexa Garza who was, had a prison sentence. And it took the better part of her 20-year, pri- I'm reading from the newsletter now, took the better part of her 20-year prison sentence to complete a bachelor's degree in business administration. Okay, so she has finished it. Now she's graduated. Now she's working on this education trust or, or working with them. She's, uh, you know, whatever, to help make education available for women in prison because men have much more access to education in prison than women do. So a report Garza helped write for the nonprofit uh, organization. She had to, by the way, shuttle between prisons, go through a strip search every time she went to a class at a different prison, all that kind of stuff that men don't have to go through because they have access to a lot more classes in their prisons. In 2018, according to the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, I'm reading from the article again, women could pursue only associate degrees and certifications of office administration and culinary arts and hospitality. Okay. In... I'm just, I, I, don't, I want to do a whole conversation about that. Seriously. That's what we're doing. We're saying, oh, we have women in prison. So, you know, I mean, most women in prison, that's what, if they, could, if they just knew how to cook, they, they could get a husband and they could be fixed, you know. I mean, uh, seriously. I'm reading the article and just thinking, you've got to be kidding. Okay, whatever. That's just my rant. Daisy may cut it out before the show even hits the air anyway. So here, but here's the point. I'm reading the rest of it. Men could get associates, bachelor's, master's degrees in 21 different occupations, including welding, computer technology, truck driving, prison reform, reform legislation, so on. So anyway, the, the, the choices are supposed to have been expanded for women in 2019. Hopefully that expands even from where it is right now. But the line that killed me in the article was this, and this is just in my email this morning. I'm not looking for stuff on prison. It's not popping in for that reason. This is the chronicle of higher education. Despite, this is the line, despite being the fastest growing segment of the state's prison population, women, Garza contends, are a correctional afterthought. Forget the correctional afterthought. Forget the courses and the education stuff. Did you hear the statement? Women are the fastest growing segment of the state's prison population. Now, I know what we want to say to ourselves is, well, thank heavens we're being more equitable in our distribution of justice right now. 
But that is not what's going on. In fact, another, uh, so I get the Dallas Morning News in my inbox as well. We, we subscribe, and so I get the electronic version too. And every evening, I get this uh, evening uh, roundup or whatever they call it on the Dallas Morning News. Here is Sharon Grigsby, uh, a little note from her in, that, uh, in, in a piece of the Dallas Morning News uh, evening roundup. Cohen's most, I'm, I'm quoting now, Cohen's most recent newsletter points to a remarkable but little reported aspect of the continuing drop in murders and other violent crimes in Dallas, which I, I'm, obviously we're all happy to hear. Our city has gotten safer while also reducing arrests. Now, here's the quote from Cohen. If there is someone who is violent, they should not be on the streets, Cohen said. But arresting more people is not synonymous with making us safer. Now, obviously, this is an opinion being stated, but it's an opinion rooted in statistics and the facts that are happening in Dallas County right now. So, so, I, so let's take the concept out of sight, out of mind, and apply it directly to prisons. And then think about it in terms of the ways we're trying to think about solving the problems that we have in people's attitudes, hearts, attitudes, and minds, thoughts about abortion itself. Prison, by its nature, segregates. And segregation removes the prisoner from our presence and therefore from our seeing and therefore from our empathy. The plea in Hebrews 13 is specific. I know that. So we're not supposed to forget other believers who are in bondage, but in fact, to remember them as if we are being mistreated with them because they're in the body with us. I know that's specific to other believers, but the plea applies to us no matter who it is that's in the prison because the point about the prisons is that we erase our empathy by erasing their existence by putting them out of sight because out of sight means out of mind. That doesn't mean there's no time to put anyone in prison, but it is important for us. The point is relevant for what prison does to our concern for others. It erases it. So why are we looking to prisons to solve our problems? I did a previous, that previous episode that I did, you can, you can cover it there, but I pointed out that one in three black men at some point in their lives is going to end up in a prison somewhere. That's what the statistics say. One in three. Lo and behold, the abortion rate historically, about 30% of women have had abortions since it was legal. And we're talking about, I mean, just even having background conversations about putting them in prison. Why would we even talk about that? Not, now, so I'm not trying to debate. I'm not trying to beat a, what do, what do you do to a dead horse? You beat a dead horse? I'm not trying to beat a dead horse. I'm not trying to kick a man while he's down. The argument to put women in prison for having abortions being the dead horse. I I realize that's not a winning argument right now. I'm trying to get across why we think about it that way. And the residual of that, we still do. We may not put them in prison, but we are still discounting their humanity so that we don't empathize with where they're coming from. And I want to make sure we don't do that. We have to do something to recognize that the people who are on the opposite side of our views on these things are human beings just like us. Otherwise, it makes no sense for us to say to them, hey, those objects on the other side of the birth canal from you are also human beings, and you ought to regard them that way. We can't say that convincingly, convincingly when we're looking across the street and treating them as if they're not human beings. And if you don't hear all the vocabulary, these wild creatures out there rebelling and rioting and even in social media streams, caricaturing and characterizing other human beings as beasts or some kind of joke or something discounting their humanity. It, it, it mitigates everything inside of us that is supposed to cause us to relate to them in the way God related to us when we were in need. So, I, look, I, th- this is, um, this is the, the thing I'm trying to get at. Prisons allow us to dehumanize the very people we wish to condemn because they dehumanize others. So, of course, there's a place for incarceration. I'm admitting that. 
But incarceration inherently puts those we imprison out of sight. And if we're trying to find a way to put people with whom we disagree, people who violate moral standards, not just abortion, but any of them, people who violate moral standards we believe are as, you know, we believe people are as important as anything can possibly be, maximally important. If we think we ought to just get rid of them and, and eliminate them so we don't have to deal with them, then we're choosing to put this people out of sight and therefore out of mind. And because we can't keep thinking about them the way we do, we can't keep villainizing them and discounting their behaviors as barbaric or ignoring them. We can't keep doing that unless we can prevent empathizing with them. And that is the one thing we can never afford to do. Remember, John, to see our brother or sister in need, to shut up our heart from him? That would mean, you know, we can't claim that the love of God abides in us. So here's what I pray, and I'm going to close with a prayer. I pray with you now exactly what I prayed as the benediction for the thousands who gathered at the recent North Texas March for Life. And I mean this as a prayer. Father, we are grateful for every life you've given and every life you've spared since Roe was overturned. But we know that while that ruling has changed, hearts and minds have not. So we pray that you would change the heart of the neighbor across the street, the believer across the church, the legislator across the aisle, to see the wonder, the beauty of every life you create and drop into this world. But we also pray that you would change our hearts to love the one across the street, across the church, or across the aisle with all their differences so that we can follow your example and so they will know that we really mean it when we declare that your image is in every life, every lifetime, everywhere. Change us, change the world for you. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at berrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.